after eight years, the NDP liberal government has given us the highest cost of living ever, the fastest inflation in 40 years, the worst increases in interest rates in monetary history. Yesterday, we learned that despite all their rhetoric about social, social justice, the NDP Liberal government has given us a bigger gap between rich and poor. Welcome back. It's a week away from Ottawa and back in their constituencies for members of Parliament. And party leaders are wasting no time either. Conservative leader Pierre Polyev in British Columbia today, as you heard, they're zeroing in, pardon me, on the Liberals on affordability as the Prime Minister toured a grocery store in a Toronto suburb. There he is there greeting shoppers after his government's fall promise to stabilize grocery prices. The latest feature of their affordability plan, is it resonating with Canadians? Well, take a look at these new seat projections from Abacus Data Modeling. They show that as of November 5th, the Conservatives were in a position to win a strong majority with more than 200 seats. The Liberals on track to lose more than half their seats and fall to 69. The Bloc in position to rise to 43 seats and the NDP up to 27. What to take away from all of that? Well, who better to tell us than the front bench? Here tonight, former senior advisor to the Liberal Ontario governments of Dalton McGuinty and Kathleen Wynne, Dan Moulton. He's now a partner with Crestview Strategy. Shakir Chambers worked in Prime Minister Stephen Harper's office before becoming a policy advisor to the International Trade Minister. He's now a principal at Ernst Cliff Strategies. Former Ontario NDP MPP Gratin Singh is here. He's now vice president at Crestview Strategy. He's also the brother of federal NDP leader Jagmeet Singh, we like to disclose. And Laura Stone is a Queen's Park reporter for the Globe and Mail. Hi, everybody. Good to see you tonight. Happy uh, uh, happy Monday. Shakir, Shakir, I'll start with you. Uh, interesting that both of the leaders today chose to zero in on a cost of living messaging, albeit in different ways. Interesting, but but probably not surprising given the last number of months. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you could say what you want to say about Pierre, whether you like him or not, but he's a great communicator. And I think on this notion of affordability and economic issues has been laser focused since becoming leader of the party. And it really resonates with a lot of Canadians, right? Like if polling is an indicator, people are buying what he's selling. He does a great job of explaining why life has become more unaffordable under the Liberal government. Even when we talk about external factors or global factors, why food prices are higher, why the economy is doing bad, he does a great job of taking those issues and explaining why the Liberal government has exacerbated those issues. So for Pierre, uh, I'm not surprised he's talking about these things. And I think for the folks who are looking at Pierre and saying, you know what, all you do is criticize the Liberals, where are your plans? I don't think Pierre needs to have any plans uh, right now. As long as the narrative is high mortgage rate, high rent prices, high food prices, that has a lot of legs uh, moving forward. If the election is two years away, he doesn't need to have any detail until the election actually, uh, election actually uh, gets called. Let's talk about that for a second, Dan, because I think we have certainly seen the Liberals sharpen their message in recent weeks around climate. And we're going to talk about that in the next segment, kind of as they take criticism from the Tories on, on carbon. They're like, where's your 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 climate plan? I think that they're they're also saying the same to Shakir's point, like if you don't think the economy is doing well, if you don't think there's uh, if you think that Canadians need more help when it comes to the cost of living, like what would you do from a strategic point of view, though? Do the Tories need to offer up more details or do they ride this wave of kind of the success of their criticism for as long as they can? Well, I think that what's clear right now is that the Liberals have fallen behind on the affordability uh, issue uh, in, in terms of communicating to Canadians. They understand the challenges they're facing, uh, that they have uh, a plan that's responding to those challenges head on. And we're seeing that bear out in the polls. I don't think that the Conservatives need to have uh, any more detail to their plan other than the message that they've been communicating thus far. As the election gets closer, Shakir's right, I think they will need to put a little bit more meat on those bones. Canadians are going to start tuning in. Uh, they're going to need to see a little bit more detail from the Conservatives. For the time being, I think they're able to, to coast, but the question is, how far do they have to go? And there isn't an election around the corner. In fact, there isn't one uh, probably for several years from now. And so sustaining that momentum and, and continuing to build the support that they have is going to be crucial for them. I think they're in a position of, of great overconfidence right now. And that can be really dangerous in politics, quite frankly. How do you, from a strategic perspective, again, I'm just curious for people who have run campaigns and been in them, Grat, and like, how do you mitigate that? Because it, it, I just, you know, I think of, you know, I think of anyone in that position where your, your lead has now cemented to the degree that it has, where, you know, Abacus is projecting a more than 200 seat majority uh, win. 
if an election were a month from now, that would be great news. But if it's two years from now, like, what do you do to mitigate the possibility of overconfidence? And how does anyone, regardless of, you know, if this is the Tories, the Liberals or the NDP, how do you sustain that momentum? So I think one of the biggest issues we have right now for the Conservatives and why they should be concerned is that it's the fear of peaking too early. And I think that is a real legitimate concern for the Conservatives right now and for those who are, who are supporters of Conservatives. Uh, if anything, when you peak at this early point, you then give opposition towards, you know, if you're, if you're not in the, if you're not, you know, if you're number two in the poll or number three in the poll, you give them a long time to start picking away at that a degree of support that you have. And we know that Mr. Pierre Polivare has a lot of baggage that he brings to the table. So, uh, you know, often his, his policy is pretty much described as being an anti-climate strategy or really, you know, in Canada, it's often described that we don't vote in people, we vote out people and he's benefiting from that. So we have, you know, a, a long stretch way in which he can be taken down that just should be concerning to conservative supporters. And I think if anything, it, it demonstrates that there is, still a lot of possibility for people to respond back who don't like that kind of politics and want to see a different kind of future for Canada. What's the takeaway, Laura, do you think for the government, even though they do have uh, a couple of years, let's say, let's say, we don't know for sure, but that's certainly the way it seems to, to be shaping out. If you look and see seat projections like that, you know that you're trying harder on affordability in the past few months to land a message, but it hasn't switched, it hasn't caused like a, a big change in the polls in those months. In fact, it looks more and more like the Tories are cementing their lead. What's the takeaway, do you think, for them? Uh, I think the takeaway is we have our work cut out for us. Um, I mean, I don't think it's pretty demoralizing, I think, for the Liberals to look at, at those seat projections, quite frankly, and that they're certainly not in a rush to call an election uh, based on those. I think certainly when you look even at the Atlantic Canada uh, projections, I mean, everything that the, the Trudeau government just went through uh, with with the carbon tax and, and home heating in that part of the country doesn't appear to be resonating um, yet. And so I do think that the Liberals are starting to get more aggressive on turning the spotlight to Pierre Polyev's character. And we're certainly seeing, uh, you know, uh, more social media testing, I suppose you could say, of advertisement, kind of turning the spotlight as to who he is, trying to link him to Republicans and, and Trump and, and right, you know, very right leading politics of the United States. So I think, you know, as things, events aren't going very well for the Liberals, policies seem to be sputtering. I think we're going to see them certainly turn the spotlight more to who is the conservative leader and, and really try to kind of criticize, frighten people, say, we don't want this kind of person running the country. And so I think that's what you're going to, to see the Liberals try to focus on going forward and test their strategies out in that sense, because these are not good numbers for the Liberals, certainly, uh, as we're looking at these projections. Shakir, what, what would your takeaway be for the Tories on the point around that, that Garotin was, was making, and, and Dan as well, around... Um, you know, trying to mitigate a, a sense of overconfidence. At the convention, I remember I was uh, I went to cover, you, you, you certainly heard from a lot of people who had been around for a long time that they were concerned about that and wanted to approach the polls with humility. But the kind of younger, newer members were, were there with a bit, a bit more gusto. What are, what are your thoughts on that? I think the conservatives have cautious optimism. I think there, there's, you know, you're happy to be leading in the polls by so much, but everybody's aware it could be two years till, till an election. I mean, what Pierre has been talking about is cost of living in the economy. And frankly, I mean, things can turn around in two years, right? So if that issue gets taken away from Pierre, what is he going to be talking about next? Uh, like Dan was saying, I mean, once you become this preferred prime minister in a lot of these pollings, uh, people start paying closer attention to you, right? Mm -hmm. So what else do you have to say? And I mean, I was watching Pierre's press conference today. He came out talking about acts of tax, but the media wanted to talk about a bunch of different things, whether it was tough on crime stuff, whether it was uh, someone loose in BC, just a whole bunch of different issues. So he needs to become a much more well-rounded politician on a wider range of issues than just about the economy. Because once that's off the table, we have to see if he can still maintain that support and maintain that momentum. It's going to be tough and it's going to be a challenge, but I think as long as the Liberals don't have a coherent narrative on affordability on pretty much anything, uh, the Conservatives are going to look pretty good. And I mean, I was sitting here today before this panel thinking about when is the last time the Liberals had a strong week of just positive announcements and positive coverage. And I can't recall that. It's issue to issue, negative headline after negative headline. I think the polling results are kind of reflecting that.
Dan, I'll give you the last word just on that point for this segment. Look, I'll, I'll look at these seat projections and just say I remember when in July 2021, Justin Trudeau was going to win a supermajority. I remember when Paul Martin was going to win a supermajority. We often see these seat projections in the middle of mandates that suggest there's going to be these massive uh, explosions in the seat count from an opposition party. And then an election comes. Canadians start tuning in a little closer. They start getting nervous about, uh, about a potential uh, new government. Uh, and we actually see things land a lot more close to uh, a minority. And so I would, I would just suggest that uh, we're a little far off from that election. Uh, seat projections like this can only be taken uh, very as, uh, so seriously. Yeah, we're certain. I think it's important to add the caveat: we are far away, but but it also is. Um, like I saw the numbers today, and I had not seen them like that in, in a long time. So, so something to take some note of for sure.